Okay, so I'm starting now. So hello, uh, for those that are here or for those that are tuning in later. Okay, uh, welcome to this month's practice question series. So this is for the month of February and I'll be covering some of the questions uh, for each topic uh, in the practice series. So let me first give a self-introduction, then we shall kick off with the session. Okay, so my name is Kai Wen. I'm the tutor for Overmarks uh, Math level EMF and EMF. So I've been teaching for about five years already and I teach group classes for Overmark and I also do the crash courses as well that is going to happen later at the midpoint of the year. So some of my um, education history, so I'm currently studying in NTU right now. I'm in my third year of my studies and I'm studying mathematics, pure mathematics to be exact. So I, I know what I'm doing and I, I actually do love mathematics. So that's why I'm here to actually teach uh, mathematics for the long run as well. Okay, so today's agenda is actually pretty simple. I'm actually going to go through some of the questions inside the practice questions set that I released uh, before Chinese New Year last month. So I, I chose specific questions because some are difficult, some are a little bit easy. So uh, we'll play around with those questions. And then at the very end, if anyone has any math related questions, you can actually uh, ask in the chat later. Okay, so what is this series? Now it started last year, but this year I'm going to actually do it in a more full-fledged way. So this is a set of curated questions that I have chosen uh, from a batch of papers that I have starting from 2008 all the way to 2021. So inside, uh, the reason I decided to do this is to compile questions for students to practice. And these are the important questions that you guys need for your exams. Now, these questions will be released on a month-to-month -month basis, hence the name Monthly Practice Questions. And at the start of the month, you will get the question paper. And at the end of the month, you will get the solutions. Now, these solutions are full solutions. So working, uh, everything will be inside. Same with explanations as well. So just in case I don't go through the question that you want, there is at least a little bit of explanations there. Okay, and also now leading up towards the O-Levels in October, I will also be hosting a review session. So no matter the capacity, I will just do it. I'll just go through, record the session and upload it online. Okay, so this is the syllabus for EMF this year. Now the highlighted ones are the topics that I'm not covering today because these are very new topics for set force. So as the months progress, then I will put the chapters in but for now, I'll just keep to those uh, more applicable for SEC 3 and the beginning of SEC 4 topics. Okay, so some of the topics to watch out for, uh, depending on your level. So just take note that some of the topics here are pretty difficult. So I will spend a little bit more time on them. For topics that are not in this list, I will actually uh, go a little bit faster because if the questions are simple, I don't really need to spend too much time on them. So just take note that if you're in SEC 4 now, uh, the depth topic will be vectors. Okay, so this is a pretty difficult topic. So just take note. Okay, <clears throat> so just some uh, revision strategy from me. So if you're taking both AMF and EMF, my suggestion is to do an hour a day of math uh, along with studying for your other eight, nine subjects. It's always good to do a little bit of math every single day so that you get accustomed to it and you don't fall behind because there's a lot of topics, there's a lot of content to actually cover. Okay, so let's jump straight in, okay? Uh, I'm just going to run through every single question uh, that I sent out in the chat and in the Overmark Telegram group. So let's go through. If anyone has any specific questions that you want me to tackle, uh, let me know as well so that I can cover them. Okay, if not, let's start with the first question. So this is the document that I prepared. So I've copied out all the questions that I'm going through today onto this uh, document. Later, after the session, I will upload this together with the AMF one. So this will contain all my handwritten working solutions and whatnot. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> so we'll start with the first chapter, numbers and the four operations. So this chapter is pretty easy, uh, but this question is mainly from indices. In this case, is a portion that a lot of people will struggle with, hence why I want to talk a little bit about it. So for part A, the question is asking you to simplify the following expression. So let me write it down, part A. 
3 to the power of n plus 2 minus 3 to the power of n divided by 9, 3 to the power of n plus 1, minus 3 to the power of n plus 2. So it's very clear that this is an indices question because the powers contain the n terms. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, whenever you're facing such a question, first thing to always look out for is that notice that every single term contains a 3 power n or a remnant of a 3 power n. So this means that you need to pull it out using indices laws. So I'm going to separate them. So this is 9, 3 to the power of n, minus 3 to the power of n over 27, 3 to the power of n, minus 9, 3 to the power of n. Now, if you're wondering how I managed to get all of those numbers, it's because I'm using the property a to the power of m times a to the power of n, equals to a to the power of m plus n. And I'm actually separating them out. Okay, so for example, 3 to the power of n plus 2 is the same thing as 3 to the power of n times 3 to the power of 2, and hence 9. So as such, sorry, if you're joining, I'll mute you. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, let me carry on. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll continue. So every single term now contains a 3 to the power of n. So what I'm going to do is to actually cancel. So let's cancel the 3 power n's because every single term contains a 3 power n. And if you simplify, this is just 8 over 18. Answer is 4 over 9. Okay, pretty basic. Part B. Now for part B, okay, this is the equation and you're asked to solve. So part B, the question is 4 to the power of 2b minus 1 multiplied by 8 to the power of 1 minus b, which is equals to 32 to the power of b minus 2. So how do you solve this? It's the same thing. Notice how I did it for part A. I note that every single term there is of base 2. So there's a 4, there's an 8, there's a 32. They are all of base 2. So this is the basis. So I'm going to change everything into base 2. So 4 is 2 squared, so it's 2 to the power of 2 times 2b minus 1, multiplied by 2. 8 is 2 cubed, so it's 3, sorry. 1 minus b equals to 32 is 2 power 5. So 2 to the power of 5b minus, oh, okay, let's put a bracket there. Okay, so we have done it this way. Now I'm going to reuse the same law that I used above. So there's a multiplication on the left, so it's just the adding of the powers. So this 2 to the power of 4b minus 2 plus 3 minus 3b. And this is equals to 2 to the power of 5b minus 10. Next, I'm going to compare my powers. Now, I can do comparing of powers because on the left and on the right, there is only one base each. There is no uh, like some base times base on one side. You can only compare powers if each side only contains one base. So therefore, I have b plus 1 is equals to 5b minus 10b is equals to 2, 3 over 4. Okay, this is the solution. So I'll leave it here for a while. And then I'll move on. Okay, so let's move on. Next is the ratio and proportion question. So this is the question here. Okay, so both of them are very typical ratio proportion questions, hence why I chose them today. So let's start off with the first one. This is the worker question, but the only difference with this worker question is that we are dealing with three elements instead of two. Most of the time workers are always dealing with like, okay, number of men, number of hours. But for this case, we have an extra element or an extra new number, which is the number of days. So we need to deal with that. Okay. So I have a technique of how I do such questions, and I'm going to share it with you guys. So the first thing is to write out what you're given. So six men, eight hours, so just a rough one, and two days, so two days. Okay. Next, I'm going to write my goal. The goal of the question is four men, three hours a day, uh, you're looking for the number of days. 
So four men. Okay, I'm going to leave a big gap and three hours and the number of days. So my objective is to move from the top line all the way down to the bottom line. And how I'm going to do that is to use proportion. But when I do my proportion, I'm only going to do two of the terms at a time. I'm going to keep one of them constant and I'm going to change the rest. Let me show you how. So the first thing I'm going to do is to keep my number of hours that I work in the day constant. So whatever I'm keeping constant, I'm going to highlight it in pink. So it's obvious. So what I usually do is that I will always drop the values down to one and then do the proportion. So for example, I'm going to find what is one man working eight hours a day. How many days will this guy take? Now, it should be obvious that if the number of people drop, the amount of time that you need or the number of days that you need will increase. So this is 12 days. A simple analogy, if you're given a group project and maybe a group of five, and let's say four of your groups decide not to do anything, you have to take on the five people's job. So your amount of work has increased. The amount of time that you need has increased. So you can see eight hours, I keep it constant again. What I'm going to do now is to make the men equals to four. So four men, same thing, eight hours keep constant. And how many days would it take? Now I have four people to share 12 days worth of work. So this is 12 divided by four, which is three days. And voila, if you notice my men is now constant. Okay, my men, I have reached the men portion already. Next, I'm going to do with the hours. So I'm going to keep the number of men constant, but I'm going to drop this to one hour. So let's think about it. If I have four men spending eight hours of, uh, of work to do, okay, and it's going to take three days, but now I tell them they only can spend one hour a day. This means that they need to spread out these eight hours to other days. So how many days is that? 24. Why 24? Eight times three. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is to increase my hours to now three hours a day. So it's just dividing 24 by three until it's eight. Okay, you need to read the question. The question is asking you for the difference in the number of days or how many more days. So the difference is two, it's answer. Okay, so a common question that I always get is that, can I write my workings like this? The answer is yes. You can actually just list out your workings like this and it's very clear how you're doing the question. Some people will actually work it out. So they will put the workings here. So six times two equals to 12. If you want to do so, you can, but it's not compulsory. Okay, so for example, they'll take 12 over four equals to three. Okay, but just writing it in rows and like in proportion sense is actually good enough to solve the question. Okay, so this is a typical one. Next is part B. So for part B, the question states that I have Y is inversely proportional to the square of X. So let's do that first. Y is inversely proportional to the square of X. And this is Y is equals to K over X squared. Now, the question says that find the percentage decrease in Y when X has increased by 300%. Okay. So how do you attempt this? Now, since there is going to be a change in values, I'm going to take some unknowns. So I'm going to let, uh, let's choose x1, y1 as the original values, x2 and y2 as the new values. So now I'm going to have two sets of equations, one in terms of the original and one in terms of the new. So let's write it out. Y1 is equals to K over X1. Y2 equals to K over X2. Now, a common question that I get is why the K I don't have a K1, K2? The reason is because K is a constant. So there is actually no change in the value of K. The only thing that changes is your X and Y value. Next, the question says that X has increased by 300%. So this is where the first common mistake will begin. So x2, we're going to figure out how many times of x1 is this. And what is it? Is it three or four? A lot of people think it is three, but that's not correct. 
answer should be four. Why? Because you're increasing by 300%. The word buy means that you're topping up an additional 300%. You have your base 100, you need to put on an additional 300%. So therefore it is four times, not three. So please be very careful. Since my x2 has changed, I'm going to substitute so into my new equation. So y2 is equals to k over 4x1 holding square. Okay, and I get something like this. I'm going to split it up. So k, sorry about that. k over 16x1 square. And now if you notice very carefully, there's actually a portion of the y1 there, k over x1 square. So I'm going to do the substitution. Okay, so this is one over 16 multiplied by y1. And now I have found my relationship between y1 and y2. So the relationship is y2 is one over 16 of y1. And once you get this relationship, you are pretty much done with the question. You just need to solve. The question says that uh, you need to find the percentage decrease. So let's just calculate. So percentage, will be final minus initial over initial times 100%. So y2 minus y1 over y1 times 100%. Substitute the appropriate values. So one over 16 y1 minus y1 over y1 times 100%. And you're actually going to get negative 93, three over four percent. Now at this junction, you need to be very careful. The question states a percentage decrease. So they are already implying the negative sign. So therefore, your final answer is positive. Okay, you cannot put the minus sign there because it doesn't answer the question. Okay, so this is the final answer. Okay, so I'll leave the working here a bit for this question. So I will be uploading these solutions. So don't need to worry if you cannot copy fast enough. And also the recordings will be provided. So yeah, in case I am writing a bit too fast and you cannot catch. Okay, great. I'm going to move on because I do have a lot of topics to cover. So I'm going to go into percentage next. Okay. So this is the percentage question. Ivan invested some money in a savings account for two years. The rate of compound interest was fixed at 10% per annum, compounded half yearly. Okay, so this is an important word. At the end of the two years, there was this amount in his account. How much did this guy invest in his account? Okay, so let's write out the formula for compound interest. So compound interest is T is equals to P, one plus R over 100 to the power of N. Okay, compound interest counts the total amount that you earn. Simple interest counts the interest that you have earned. So you must be very careful which of the following that you're calculating. For this, this is compound interest. So let's fill up all the values. This is 9724.05 is equals to the principal. This is the amount that he invested. So it's the amount that is the unknown. One plus, now this one you need to careful. This 10% is compounded half yearly. So every single run that you're doing your compound interest, you're actually only taking 5%, not 10%. So you need to divide this by two. So this is the first common mistake here. The next one is the value of N. Now there's a difference between simple interest, the T, and compound interest, the N. For simple interest, the T is the number of years that is being, uh, being calculated for simple interest. For the value of N, is the number of times. So uh, number of times. So please be very careful. Okay, this is four. Why? Because two years you're doing it twice a year. So it's four. Okay, you just need to divide the right hand side of P down and you should get a very nice answer of $8,000. Okay, and we're done. Simple question. Okay, so just take note of the difference between compound and simple. Okay, this is the main difference between them. Simple, the formula is also different. Compound interest is actually given to you in the formula sheet. Okay, let's move on to number four. So for number four, the question is a bit difficult, a little bit. 
So let's look at it. Sorry, huh? flipping my notes. Looking at question two. Okay, here you go. So for this, now, the diagram shows the speed time graph of a particle over 15 seconds. The particle uniformly decelerates from 10 meters per second to V meters per second in five seconds. It then maintains the same speed for the first five seconds and accelerates uniformly at two meters per second squared for another five seconds. The distance traveled in the first five seconds is 35. Calculate the value of V. Okay, the only thing difficult with this question is part C. So I'll spend a bit of time there. Okay, but let's first talk about the beginning. Now, uh, I teach my normal students how to do this kind of questions using a diagram. So this is the diagram. So we start off with uh, distance, speed, and acceleration. Now, these are the different types of graphs that they can give you. And this diagram here will tell you what is the relationship between distance, speed, and acceleration. So if you are given a distance time graph and you're looking for speed, okay, you look for the gradient of the line. If you're given a speed time graph looking for the acceleration, same thing, look for the gradient. If you're given an acceleration time graph looking for the speed, you find the area under the graph. And if you're given a speed looking for distance, you're looking for the area under the graph. So with this diagram here, it makes it very clear since we are looking for the acceleration. So we are given a speed time graph, we are looking for the gradient of the line. Yeah, correct. Right. We're given a speed time graph. We are looking for the speed, right? Okay, so what are we given in the question? The question says that the distance traveled in the first five seconds is 35. So means that the area under this graph here is 35. Okay, so this is the area of a trapezium. So 35 is equals to half the speed, which is V. So it's V plus 10 multiplied by five. So for V, V should be four. Part B. <clears throat> so the question wants you to figure out what is the particle speed at this particular point here. Okay, there's a piece of information given to you is that the acceleration of the line, or the acceleration of the graph is two meters per second. This implies that the gradient of the line at this portion here is two. Okay, so let's call the, the speed V2 and we can do a substitution. So two is equals to V2 minus four divided by 15 minus 10, so for V2, and V2 is 14. So let's write down here that V2 is the final speed. Okay, so now I want to go into this, the corresponding distance time graph. So this is where it's a little bit challenging. So let's draw it out. So the first thing to do when you're given a distance time graph okay, is you need to mark out all of the important points based on the diagram. So the diagram tells you that there are three important points, 15, uh, 5, 10, and 15. So there are three sections of this graph and you need to figure out the corresponding uh, lines and what they look like. So this is section A, section B, and section C. So I'm gonna do it in three sections and explain it in three different sections. So this is five. This is 10 and this is 15. Okay. So we are drawing from a distance time graph to a, a speed time graph to a distance time graph. So based on my chart here, I need to look at the area. So let's ask ourselves, in section A, what is happening to the area under the graph? It is obviously increasing, right? Because you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but you are increasing at a decreasing rate because the amount of area that you're increasing by is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. If you look at the way I draw my rectangles, it's actually getting smaller and smaller. Hence, this is a decreasing gradient graph. So the curve. Okay. This is the first part. Next, okay looking at this part here, 
what is the area happening? What's happening to the area? Okay, if you draw rectangles, you realize that the area is increasing at a constant rate. Okay, because you're still increasing by the same amount every single time. So this is a straight line graph going upwards. Like this, so you must connect. Okay, and the last thing down there, okay, which is the part C, same thing, ask yourself, what's happening to the area? You're still increasing because you're traveling, right? Okay, but the amount of area that you're increasing by is increasing. So you're increasing at an increasing rate. So therefore, the graph is going. Okay, so this is the main graph and this is how it looks like. I know it's a bit ugly, but uh, it's supposed to be curve, straight curve. That is how the graph should actually look like. Okay, this is a common question in exams. Uh, a lot of people cannot do. So please be very careful with this. Okay, always ask yourself, what is the type of graph? What is the type of line that you're going to see? And how do you chart out between the different lines? Sometimes you're looking for gradient. Sometimes you're looking for how the area changes. Sometimes you're looking for how the gradient changes. Okay, and this is how we actually do it. Okay, uh, if anyone has any questions for this, uh, later at the end, then you can ask. Okay, let's move on to number five. Algebraic expressions and formulae. So I chose the number pattern question okay, because number pattern is deep, uh, more deadly than the rest. Okay, so this is the question. The first four terms of a sequence is given by the following. 8, 64, 1, 216, and 512. You need to determine what is the next term in the sequence. Okay, I'll give you the answer. The answer is 1,000. Okay, so the issue is how do you get this answer? Okay, so this is where the difficult thing of number patterns come in. If you cannot see it, you won't be able to do. So let me write out the numbers for you. So T1, T2, T3, T4. Let's just use the first form. And this is 8, 64, 216, 512. Now, just by looking at the numbers, eh, okay, a lot of a lot of them are just eight power something. So, for example, T one is eight power one, sixty four is eight power two, uh, T power four for T four is eight power three. But the problem is that your two one six is not there. <laughs> so how? What you can do is to actually pull out the number eight from every single number, and you'll realize that this is one, this is eight, uh, this is twenty seven. Oops, sorry. And this is 500. Eh? No, this is 64, sorry. Okay. And these numbers here are pretty special. Why? They are cube numbers. Okay, they are cubic numbers. So you're just cubing the term number. Okay. So if you notice the pattern now, you're just taking the n number and cubing it. So final answer, the n cube. Okay. Now, a lot of questions people will ask is, how do you spot this kind of thing? Uh, it really goes down to experience and you need to practice a lot of number pattern questions because not all questions are the same. It is the one topic where you cannot really prepare for. It depends on the question in exams. The next part, part C, so the question is asking you to compare the two solutions there. So you're looking at 10 and 8, 66, 64, 218, 216, and 514 and 512. If you notice, the numbers are just plus 2 of each other. So the answer is just A and Q plus 2. It is a pretty easy question. Okay, the difficult part will be part B. Okay, that's all for this question. Let's move on to functions and graphs. So for functions and graphs, uh, this is the question. Ah, okay. Uh, this one is not difficult, uh, but I think it's good to go through. So let's have a crack at this. So the diagram shows the line y equals to negative 2x plus 1, and I have a curve of y equals to x, 1 minus x plus k. 
the line cuts the x-axis at A and the y-axis at B. Calculate the length of AB, giving your answers in the form of root A over B. So step one, you actually need to go and figure out what are the coordinates of A and B. We are given the equation of a line, which is y is equals to negative 2x plus 1. So straight away, you can figure out one thing. Just by looking at the positive one, this implies to you your y-intercept. So this coordinate here is 0, 1. So that's B, set up. Next, at A, what happens? Okay, you need to remember this concept. Whenever your line cuts the x-axis or cuts the y-axis, one of the x or y components will be zero. When you're cutting the x-axis, your y component is zero. So you just need to sub in y equals to zero and you will get that x is half. So the coordinate here is half comma zero. Okay. Now to solve the question, you just need to go into the formula, just type, uh, write out the formula and you will get your answer. So the length is equal to the square root of half square plus one square. Okay, and the final answer is the root of five over four. Okay, and using, speed this up, this is root five over two. Okay, because you're able to square root of four, so you can speed it up like this. Next for part B, given that the curve passes through the points one quarter and half, find the value of k. Okay, so my curve is this equation, x1 plus x, or is it 1 minus x? Oh, 1 minus x, sorry. 1 minus x plus k. Now, if a point passes through a line or a curve, you can just do a simple substitution and you will get the answer. So this is half is equals to 1 quarter, 1 minus 1 quarter plus k k is equals to 5 over 16. Okay, this is straightforward. And the last one is part c. Okay, so the question is asking you for the maximum point of the curve. Um, there are two ways of doing it. You can search out for the x-intercepts and then you find the midpoint, that is method one. Method two, you can complete the square. So you're actually given the equation of the line or equation of the curve. So let's write out the equation of the curve. So the equation of the curve is y is equals to x, one minus x, we have just solved for k. So it's five over 16. So writing this out, you get x minus x squared plus five over 16. To complete the square, we're going to put the x squared in front and we want to change the coefficient of x squared to be positive. So this is negative of x squared minus x minus five over 16. And now we can complete the square. So how do you complete the square? First thing to do okay, is to draw a bracket for a square, write the number and leave a hole here and here. Okay, that's where you're going to start filling up stuff. There's an X, so you copy an X. There's a minus sign, put a minus sign. The next number beside the negative sign is going to be half of the coefficient of X. So this is half. Okay, so how do I get this half here? Okay, this is just coefficient of x divided by 2. And what you're going to do now is going to minus away this half that I've introduced in. So it's the same thing, coefficient of x all in square. Okay, do the manipulation and you will get your answer. So you completed the square. This is x minus half all in square plus 9 over 16. So therefore, the max point is half, 9 over 16. Okay, if you forgot your concepts, uh, how to read formula, y is equals to a, x minus h squared plus k, the max or the turning points are just h comma k. Okay, you need to be careful of this sign. If the k is positive, then your turning point k will be positive. But if the h is the reverse, huh? because this is x minus h, so if the h tag is actually a positive number, when you write into your turning point, it's a negative number. So you must be careful. It is just a concept, so please recall. Okay, let's move on. So I'm done with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine more questions. Okay.
Uh, the behind are a little bit longer because the concepts are harder. So yeah, I'll spend a little bit more time there. These few are still pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go. Solving equations. So one part A. Oh, this is question two. Okay, this is 5x is equals to 10x squared. This is a very common trap that a lot of schools like to set for students. A lot of people will just happily cancel x on both sides and you will lose a solution. So please be careful. You first need to factorize okay, the x out. All right, let's pull out 5x up. So you get 2x minus 1 equals to 0. x is 0 or x is half. So a lot of people will go and cancel. So this is the mistake. Huh? Okay, so mistake is 5x is equals to 10x squared. Happily go and cancel. And then therefore, 10x equals to 5 x is half. If you do that, you're actually going to lose the solution of x is equals to zero. So please do not cancel. You will get it wrong. Next is for part B. Okay, the question is y squared plus one, y squared minus one, and this is equal to zero. Actually, this is a pretty easy question because you know that the product of any two things, if it's equals to zero, means that one or the other must be zero. So y plus plus one equals to zero. Oh, y squared minus one is zero. This is not possible, so you reject. Y is plus minus one. Okay, this is super easy. Okay, the reason they test this question here is because of this plus minus sign. You must remember that when you are plus minusing anything, okay, you eh, sorry when you're square rooting anything, you need to remember to plus minus, or else you will get the question wrong. Okay, we are done. So we move on into the next chapter. So I'm going to skip uh, set notation and matrices. I'm going to go straight into the problems in real world context question, which is the scuba diver question. So this is the scuba diver question. This one. Okay. Uh, this is not a difficult question. It, it just looks very long. And this is a very common kind of exam question uh, for paper two. So at the end of every paper two for EMF, there will always be this long database question where you will need to be able to solve the whole thing and work out the final answer. Okay. Uh, most of the time, there will always be one part, which is the very long part where you will need to explain so it's something like this in part C. Uh, this one is a little bit easier than those kind of questions, but there are a lot out there. So please go and practice them before you sit for your prelims or sit for your school exams. Okay, so how do you tackle this question? So there's a lot of information here. I'm just going to go straight into the question and I'm going to fish out the information when needed. So the question says that the volume of the diving cylinder is measured by the volume of the internal compartment and this is shown by figure two, work out the volume in liters of the diving cylinder. Now the question states that the internal compartment has a diameter of 20 centimeters and a height of 75. So you just need to use these two pieces of information and you can solve. So I'm gonna write it here. So for part A, the volume of the cylinder, so volume will be equals to the volume of the cylinder Oops, sorry, I spelled cylinder wrongly. Does the volume of the hemisphere? The volume of the cylinder, okay, how do you calculate this? Now, the diameter you know is 20, so you can actually figure out what is this height here. Okay, this hemisphere height is actually just half of the diameter, so this here is 10. If you know that this whole thing is 75, you know that this height here is 65. Okay, so this is how you work out everything. So I'm going to write everything in a single step. So the volume of a cylinder is pi r square h. So pi, then square, multiplied by 65. Plus the volume of the hemisphere, this is 2 third pi r cubed. So 2 over 3 pi, the radius is 10 cubed. And if you work it out properly, this is 7166, 2 over 3 pi. Final answer is 
0.5147. Answer is 22.5 liters, GSF. Okay, the question wants your answers in liters. Okay, part B, we're going to use the information in the question. So the question tells you a formula here. Volume of oxygen is equal to the volume of the cylinder multiplied by the pressure in the cylinder divided by the atmospheric pressure. The question tells you that the pressure in the cylinder is 210 and the atmospheric pressure is 101. You're just substituting values in. So it's not difficult. So the volume of oxygen is just 7166.2 over 3 pi multiplied by 210 divided by 110, 1.10, hey, 1 sorry. Okay. And you simplify this, final answer is 4,680 liters. Okay, now comes the long part C. Okay, actually, it can be solved in one step, to be very honest. So the question states that the volume of oxygen required is the breathing rate times the duration times the ambient pressure. And you're given a lot of information. Assuming that the breathing rate is 18 liters per minute, so this one per minute, huh? For every five meters that you go down, the pressure has increased by 0 0.5. So you need to work out everything properly. The question says that you're going down for 1.5 hours at a depth of 20 meters. Okay. So do you require what? Okay, the volume of the breathing rate, which is 18. Okay, multiplied by the duration. Now your duration is calculated in minutes. So you need to change your 1.5 hours into minutes. So you multiply by 60. And, <coughs> excuse me. and the ambient pressure. So if you read, every five meters you go under underwater, you increase by 0 0.5 from the atmosphere. So you start off with the atmosphere and you increase five meters, right? You're going down 20. So you're increasing four times. So four times 0 0.5. So you'll require a total of 4,876 liters, 0.2 liters. Okay, you can clearly see that the required is more than the capacity. So it is not possible. Okay. So this is the answer. It's pretty short. Okay, but usually such questions are not so short. Lah. This is just an exception of a simple problem sum question. Okay, uh, this question. Uh, hmm. Okay, I'm going to skip this chapter, okay, because I'm running out of time. Uh, this question is pretty challenging, so I, I'm going to skip it. Um, this question, if you are, if you want to know how to do the difficult one, is part B, part one. Okay, uh, you can refer it to my answer key, but I'm going to skip it for now because I I don't have the time. I'm running out of time. Okay, so I apologize for that. But I'll move on to the more important chapters, which is the next chapter: congruency, similarity. Uh, this one can go through. Okay. This one. Okay. Congruency similarity. So let's take a crack at this. The reason I want to go through this is because a lot of people have problems with writing of the proof of congruency and similarity questions. So uh, I'm here to actually help you with that. Okay, so for part A, the question asks you to figure out what is EDX. So is this angle here? Okay, uh, I mean, it's not super difficult. What you can do, okay, let's see. We know that Xe bisects the two angles. So the definition of a bisector is that it cuts an angle exactly in half. So you know that this angle here is 50 degrees. By alternate angles, we know that this is 50 as well. So therefore, this here is just 80. Okay, so I'll write the full proof out for you. So for part A, uh, first thing we know that we know that angle BEX so e, e, x is 50 degrees, okay? And the reason is the bisect. Okay, remember that every single statement of angles that you write must contain a reason. So next one is that dxe, 
is also 50 degrees, and this is because of alternate angle. Now, because I'm, I'm rushing for time, I'm not spelling everything full, but please, in exams, please spell everything full so that you don't lose marks for nothing. Therefore, EDX is 80 angles in a triangle. Finish. Part B. Okay, this is the congruency proof. Oh, similarity proof, sorry. So the question asks you to prove that triangles A, B, E is similar to E, X, D. So you need to recall what are the similarity proofs and what are the congruency proofs. For congruency, there's four. For similarity, there is three. Congruency is SSS, ASA, SAS, RHS. Similarity is triple A. Uh, two angles, one side, and two sides, one angle. Most of the time, whenever we are writing proofs for similarity questions, we are always going to use triple A. That is the one that I'm going to use. So the first thing to take note is that this angle we can find okay, is by corresponding angle. Okay, because of the parallel lines there, we have a corresponding angle. Angle BAE is 50. Okay, so let's write it down. BAE is 50 degrees okay, because of corresponding angle. Next, uh, by alternate angles, we can figure out what is ABE as well. So this one can be figured out using alternate angles as AC is parallel to EX. So that's 50. So let's write it down. Uh, we know that uh, ABE is equals to BEX. And this is also equals to EXD. Okay, and this is 50 alternate angle. Okay, uh, it's good to write down that this is the A, this is the A. Now, uh, if you think about it, triple A and double A is actually the same thing. So you can actually stop at two A's because if two of your angles are equal, the last one will obviously be equal. So by double A similarity test, Okay, the two lines are the two triangles are similar. A B E similar to triangle E X D. Finish. Okay, this is the proof. Next, for part C, uh, you need to state another triangle that is similar to A B E and E X D. Okay, there's another one there. Okay, it's just uh, A C D. It's the whole entire thing is also going to be similar. So this one is easy. So this is part C. Triangle ACD. Next, for part D, I'm going to write this here because it's a bit long. Okay, part D, part one. So the question states that the ratio of AE to ED is 4 is to 3. So I'm going to erase all of my markings. Okay, this is 4 is to 3. Find the ratio of CD to XD. Okay, very convenient. From part C, we already know that triangles ABE is similar to ACD. Okay, so we can use the ratios. We can write it out. AB over AC is the same thing as BE over CD is the same thing as AE over AD. And this is 4 over 3. Okay. So now I want the full thing, the full ratio. So CD, which is the whole big triangle, over the baby triangle, the ratio is 7 over 3. Okay, this is the answer. Okay, and for part 2, the question states that triangle ABE is 36 cm square. Find the area of BXE. So if you take BXE, it's just the half of it. So what I'm going to do first is to go and figure out what is um, the trapezoid, the parallelogram size, B E X C. Once you figure that out, divide it by two, you can get one of them. Okay. Now since all of the triangles inside the diagram are similar, you can actually use a lot of ratios to go and figure out, and we're going to use the properties of geometrical similar planar figures, which is this formula. L1 over L2 holding squared. 
is equals to a1 over a2. So this is a common formula to use. So let's use this together. So triangle EXD over triangle ABE okay, is equals to 3 over 4 holding squared. Okay, and you know that ABE is 36. So you know that triangle EXD now is 21 quarter. Repeat the same process. And now instead of finding EXD, I'm going to find what is ACD, which is the entire thing, so that I can take the entire thing minus ABE minus EXD. Okay, repeat the same working. So this one, you can do it on your own. You will see that ACD is actually 1101 over 4 cm squared. So what is BXE? Okay, it's just half. Okay, because we're going to take half, take the big triangle minus the 36 minus the 21 quarter. And the final answer here is 27. Seems good. So this one is using the geometrical ratio to solve the question. Okay, well done. Next. Properties of circle. Okay, so a few more questions. I think it's about five. I think I'm going to skip the menstruation question as well, okay, so I don't have time. So I will do properties of circle, trigo, and then the coordinate jump question. I think I will skip menstruation and probability for today because I don't have the time. Okay, I'll skip this. Okay, uh, if you need the questions, uh, please go and refer to your my answer key, which will come out at the end of the month. Okay, properties of circle. So in the diagram, the points P, Q, R, S, and T lie on a circle, center O. X, T, Y is a tangent to the circle. P, R, S is equals to 109, and P, S, T is equals to 41. Giving your reasons for each of your answer, you need to find everything. Okay, so properties of circle, this is question four. Oh yeah, let me flip my notes. Okay, so we are looking for P, Q, S. Now, this is an easy one. So always look out for butterfly. Okay, so this is the first one. We know that PQS is actually equals to um, for the 109 because of the butterfly. So I've highlighted it in parts A. So angle PQS is 109. Okay, degrees. The answer, the reason is because angles in the same segment. Okay, so recall that you cannot just use butterfly. Okay, you must state the correct reason, and the reason is angles in the same segment. Okay, next is PTS. So PTS, uh, if you look carefully, there's a cyclic quote. So one, two, three. Okay, so cyclic chord is a figure that touches, uh, it's a four-sided figure inscribed in a circle that touches the four corners, or uh, all four corners must touch the circle. Okay, so for part B, PTS is equals to 180 degrees minus 109. And the answer here is 71. Okay, this is straightforward. So this is opposite angles in a cyclic chord. But see, you're looking for YTS. So YTS is the exterior angle there. So how do you find this? Now, this one is pretty long. So we're going to search out for a few things. So number one, we know that this is tangential. So we just need to find what is OTS and you will get the answer. Okay, so that is the main goal. So before we find OTS, let's find what is POT first, which is this angle here. So angle POT using properties again is angle at center equals to two times angle at circumference with the arrow. So there's an arrow shape here. Okay. So angle POT 
is the same thing as 2 times 41 degrees and this is 82 angle at center reason now since you know OTS we can figure out what is OTP okay so OTP is equals to now this is an isosceles triangle because these two are radiuses so OTP is just 180 minus 82 over 2 so angle O oops wrong color OTP okay, is equals to 180 minus 82 divided by 2. Answer is 49. Okay, so this is because of isosceles triangle. And we also know that PTS is 71. So you can find what is OTS. So angle OTS is equals to 71 minus 49. This is 22. Final answer for YTS. Okay, it's just 90 degrees minus 22, and this is 68. Okay, the reason is because uh, we know that XY is tangential to the circle at T, and tangential lines with a radius to O perpendicular. So this is the reason, so a complementary angle. Okay. 10971 is 68. Part D is OTP, just nice we found it here. It's done to 49. Okay, next is trigo. So two more questions. So like I said, I'm skipping mensuration and I'm skipping the probability question. So we will end by the coordinate jump question. Okay, trigo. So ABC is a right angle triangle such that AB is equal to 17, BC is 8. Okay, so let's write that on 17, 8. And given that D is a point on AC such that CD is CD over AD is equal to 2 over 3. Okay, now before we even move on, now we can clearly see that this is a right triangle. So by Pythagoras theorem, 8, 15, 17 is a Pythagorean triplet. So this whole AC is 15 units. If we know that AC is 15, means this here is 6. Yeah, and this here is 9. Okay, so that's in terms of ratio. Next, we need to find what is the tangent of CBD. Okay, so this angle here. So you just need to fish out the right triangle. And I think it's straightforward for part A. Tangent of CBD. Okay, is equals to 6 over 8, which is just 3 quarter. Part B, we are looking for cosine of ADB. Okay, this one you need to recall the concept. So the cosine of ADB. Okay, cosine of an obtuse angle is equals to the negative of the cosine of the acute angle. So this is negative cosine of angles uh, BDC. Now for a cosine of an angle, this is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse you don't have, so you can work it out. And remember that this is a negative value. So this is six over the square root of six square plus eight square. Okay, and the final answer, if you work it out, is just negative three over five, super easy. Okay, so three quarter, negative three over five. So this is using obtuse angles to solve the question. Now this, this month, I'm going to do this question. Next one, I will do the ones with the application so that I can spread out different types of concepts all over the place. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip mensuration. I'm going to go into coordinate job. So this should be the last question that I covered. Okay, then I'll leave the remaining time for any questions that anyone has. Uh, also, if anyone needs the solutions, you can either PM me, I can send it to you, or you can wait for the end of the month, which is like in another five days, and then the solutions will be released. Okay, this is the very last question, and then I'll end for today. So part A. 
So the line 5x equals to y plus 14 passes through the point 3p, 7p, find the value of p. This is super easy. So 5x is equals to y plus 14. So if you know that a point passes through a line, this will imply that the point will fit the line now. So I can substitute. So 5 of 3p, 7p plus 14. 8p is equals to 14. p is equals to 1, 3, oh, 4. Super easy. Part B. Okay, find an equation of the line passing through the points negative 1, 3 and 7, negative 2, leaving your answers in the form of ax plus by equals to c, where a, b, and c are integers. Okay, so first thing I want to do is remember the concepts. Okay, I have two points, so let's mark out the points. Negative 1, 3, and 7, negative 2. So negative 1, 3, and 7, negative 2. I want it in the form of ax plus by equals to c, so that one, uh, we can do it later. First thing to always do when you need an equation of a line, okay, is the gradient and the y-intercept. So let's solve the gradient first, because that's the easiest. So for the gradient of a line, it's negative 2 minus 3 over 7 minus negative 1. And this value here is negative 5 over 8. We got 1. Next, to solve out for the y-intercept, we're going to substitute this gradient first into the line together with a point. So I'm going to choose maybe the negative 1 and 3 is the easiest. So 3 is equal to negative 5 over 8 multiplied by negative 1 plus c, c is equal to 19 over 8. Okay, and then you have the full solution. So y is equal to negative 5 over 8 uh, x, sorry yeah, for the bad handwriting, plus 19 over 8. And we can make it in what the question wants. So this is 5x plus 8y is equal to 19. Soft. Okay. Last one is part C. So for part C, the question states that the distance between points A and B is the root of 10k plus 4. You need to find the possible values of k. So just recall the distance formula. So this is just um, Pythagoras theorem. So the distance formula states that 10k plus 4, which is what the question provided, is equals to 1 minus 1 minus k holding squared plus 2k minus 1 squared. So just take note of the way that I'm writing this portion here. Okay, I'm taking one minus bracket of one minus k. Now, a lot of people will forget the bracket. And if you do so, you will make uh, algebra mistake there. Both sides have a square root. So this is 10k plus 4. The one minus one will wipe out. So that is just a k square. And then this is 4k square minus 4k plus 1. And we get a quadratic equation. So 5k squared minus 14k minus 3 equals to 0. Okay, simplify this. This is k minus 3, 5k plus 1 is equals to 0. k equals to 3 or k equals to negative 1 over 5. And these are the answers for the question. Okay, the question asks for all possible values, so you can actually provide both. So there's nothing to check, and you will get both of them right as well. Okay, this is the solution. Okay, and I think I'll stop here. So for the mensuration and the so for the angle triangle polygon mensuration and the probability question, I will skip for today. I will still write out the solutions in my free time, and then I'll upload it into the chat later for the review questions. Okay, I'm going to pause, I'm going to stop the recording.